www.vision-squared.com. Welcome. My name is Alana Weston, and I'm Creative Director of Selfridges. The event tonight is the second in a series of four discussions that Selfridges are staging in collaboration with Intelligence Square, the live events organization, as part of Project Ocean at Selfridges. Our goal, alongside our partners, the Zoological Society of London, is to take the issue of overfishing to a wider audience, to raise money for the establishment of marine protected areas, and to give people a chance to make a difference by voting with their forks and deciding to stop eating endangered fish. As you will have seen as you've walked around the store, Selfridges is throwing everything in his creative arsenal behind this issue. From our windows, to Catherine Hamnett's t-shirts, from our chef's recipes, to art pieces, the message is clear. We need to protect the ocean and its creatures for future generations. Our talk series with Intelligence Squared is intended to explore the issues in more detail with an impressive lineup of activists, business people, and scientists. Last week, Hugh Fernley Whittingstall and others discussed the problem of overfishing and discard in particular. And tonight, our distinguished panel will be talking about one possible solution to overfishing, which is the marine protected area. Then next Thursday, we're gathering some restaurateurs and other experts to examine what fish we should and shouldn't be eating. And finally, on Thursday, June 2nd, we have a special storytelling event in which four very different ocean-going explorers will relate their tales of passion and adventure on the seas. Our chair this evening is a well-known television presenter. She's fronted numerous programs on the marine environment, including Sea Watch and The Abyss. She's also a qualified commercial diver and is president of the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. I'd like to welcome Kate Humble. She's been ex incredibly enthusiastic about this project from its inception and has actually been diving in the Philippines with the team from Project Seahorse, very near to where Selfridge's marine protected area will be established. Thank you, Kate, for hosting this evening. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, is my mic working? Can everyone hear me? Um, this evening is about you. Um, the wonderful thing about this Project Ocean project is that Alana recognised that the marine, the, the question of our marine environment and its conservation has been a little bit, it's kept, been kept a little bit close to home. You know, there's a lot of these guys all working tirelessly to uh, try and protect our oceans. But the problem with marine conservation is that you're dealing with a, project, uh, with a problem that many of us can't see, never see. It's not like terrestrial conservation. It's not like trying to protect a beautiful piece of woodland or primary rainforest or moorland or desert or a polar region where you can actually see the impact of the damage that's being caused to that area. In the sea, we're causing massive damage, but we don't see it. And so people tend not to care as much about the sea and about the astonishing array of life that it supports more than our terrestrial life. So, and it's, it's also an area that we know very little about. There's a, a line that I've probably trotted out in almost every marine program that I've done, which is that people know more about the moon than they do about the oceans. And so this is an area that's incredibly important for not just science to get behind, but for everybody to get behind, to understand, and to become engaged with. And that's why I was so delighted um, when Selfridges said, do you, do you want to be involved in Project Ocean? And I was there, hands up, yes please, because this is a great way for everybody to get involved. So I'm asking all of you this evening to not give any of our speakers tonight an easy time. 
The idea is that they're here to talk about marine protected areas, marine reserves, marine conservation zones, MPAs. M anyway, if they start going descending into acronyms or anything you don't understand, for heaven's sake, put your hand up. I'm going to jump on. They've, they've all been lectured this evening about making themselves clear, about making themselves understood. They've also been lectured that they're only allowed to talk for five minutes each. There'll be a certain amount of pinging ladies and gentlemen, um, because what we do want is a lot of time after you've heard from all our speakers tonight for you to ask anything you like. You know, this is a free-for-all. This is, this is about all of us leaving here really informed about the problems that our oceans face and what we can do about it, all of us. So let me introduce our speakers first of all. Our first speaker is going to be Andy Sharpless. He's the CEO of Oceana, which is the largest international organization fo focused solely on ocean advocacy and conservation. And they achieved something really miraculous this year, which I will let Andy tell you about later on. It's just brilliant. Uh, Professor Callum Roberts um, is a marine conservation biologist in the Environment uh, Department at the University of York. He's going to be talking principally about uh, marine conservation zones around the UK. So Andy will talk about marine reserves generally. Uh, Callum will talk about them, how they affect us. Um, Dr. Fred Ming is the Director for Environment Protection in the Government of Bermuda. He also has uh, some very good news to share with us and uh, some very interesting uh, stories about um, how marine protected areas are being implicated in, on a grand scale, we hope. And Massio Nidong is a lawyer and project coordinator with the Papua New Guinea National Fisheries Authority. Again, she is going to be able to tell us a great deal about uh, community fishing, uh, the problems and the successes that they've had in PNG. So I'm going to shut up now because these are the guys you want to hear from. And let's start with Andy. So the story starts tonight with an amazing fact, which is that the... I think it's, yeah, I, I'm getting the signal that my mic is not working. Can you hear me? I'll shout. The, um, the, the, the amazing fact is that the oceans are collapsing. How do we know that? Well, we know it because when scientists are asked the question, how many fish are out there, answer after answer comes back with the, the answer that there are alarmingly few. For example, one study showed that if you look at the big fish, the predator fish, there are now 10% that they are at levels of 10% of what they were 50 years ago. That would be as though this population was the, this room was the audience, the, this audience was the fish in the ocean 50 years ago, and now we have from you over. The, amazingly, the catch, the wild catch of all of the fish in all of the world's ocean after increasing as far back in human history, year after year as we know, peaked in the late 1980s and has been declining ever since. And even the UN, not a conservation group, says that three quarters of the world's commercial fisheries are now fully fished, meaning no more room for additional fishing. All right, what's, why would you care? Well, I'll give you four reasons, three practical and one sacred. Food, a billion people around the planet, primary source of animal protein is seafood, a billion people. Jobs, 200 million jobs depend on an abundant ocean if you add up all the jobs downstream. Civic life, countless wonderful coastal towns, many of which dot the, sea the, the coasts of this wonderful country, will collapse and become ghost towns if the fisheries end. And then a kind of a sacred reason. We don't want to be the generation that is explaining to the future why we virtually exterminated the ocean. Now, what do you do about this? Well, surprisingly, it's a very solvable problem because the cause of the collapse is not pollution. That's what you, most people would assume. The cause of the collapse is something very simple. It's incredibly aggressive and short-sighted industrial-scale fishing. Why is that good news? This is a very solvable problem. We know what to do. And one of the big things to do is the topic of tonight, is to create protected zones in the ocean. They go by a lot of names. They're called marine protected areas. They're called marine reserves. They're called marine sanctuaries. 
They do different things, sometimes under the same, same name, sometimes under different names. But the concept is very simple. And the purest form of one is a no-take zone, where you declare a piece of the ocean non-fishable by anyone, non-exploitable by anyone. What is the reason for doing that? Well, you can anticipate four important benefits from that. Number one, you'll have a chance to see what a healthy, unfished, fully abundant ocean looks like. Something that we haven't really got much of in the world. 97% of the world's oceans have already been touched by human beings. Second, you will get more fish in that place and the fish will leave that place and fishermen nearby will start to have more fish to catch. Thirdly, such places become incredibly valuable tourist destinations. Scuba divers, for example, love these places. And lastly, climate change is going to have big impacts on the ocean and such places will be more resilient in the face of climate change and will provide havens for species to survive the stresses of that. I'm at my fourth minute. <laughs> so the last minute I want to use to say, these kinds of protections usefully come in a whole range of flavors. So one end is the no-take zone I just talked about. And then there, you could usefully say, we're going to declare, de 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 declare an area here where there's no bottom trawling, which is a particularly destructive form of fishing. But we'll let other kinds of fishing occur. Or here we're going to have a zone where we're going to have no fishing during the spawning season. But we'll let fishing occur during the rest of the year. Or here we will have a zone where we won't allow uh, other uh, certain kinds of nets that have high levels of bycatch. So we have to be practical. We have to think about what is the biggest threat in a particular place, and let's protect against that. If we can get some no-take zones, that's very, very good, but we can also do some other useful things. Now, at the bottom of that continuum of protections, there's a thing known as a press release. <laughs> and governments will, I'm sorry to say, sometimes tell you that they have done something that, in fact, has no content to it which is, we declared a protected zone. And if you don't know to say, well, what have you stopped? You can be misled. So I want us to be alert to the importance of being practical, but not extending that all the way down into buying into press releases. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> Have any of the panel got anything that they would like to say to Andy's comments? yet, or are you happy for us to press on? You're off the hook for the moment, but only for the moment. <laughs> Callum. Right. I think I'll stand up as well, and uh, then I'll be able to see some of the people at the back. What I want to do is to talk about what's going on in the UK, because this is the area that's uh, right next to our own shores, and uh, probably is going to uh, be of interest to a lot of you here. Well, for much of my lifetime, nothing much was going on in the UK at all. And uh, for a long time, there was, there was just a few marine protected areas, marine reserves, marine nature reserves, as they were called. Uh, but there were tiny little specks of protection in a sea that was open largely to industrial fishing of all sorts, dredging, uh, various sorts of harbor construction, and uh, a variety of uses that were not particularly conducive to uh, a pristine area of sea. But a lot of that changed in 2002. Ten years ago, the government of the UK, alongside uh, other coastal nations of the world, committed to establish a national network of marine protected areas. And uh, as governments do, they kind of put it on the back burner. We've got 10 years to do it. Uh, 2012 is our target date. So we're not going to really think about it for now. Uh, uh, and so a few years ago, they woke up to the fact that there was this commitment that was still there and uh, something needed to be done about it. So in the last few years, there has been frenzied activity, I would say, to uh, design a national network of marine protected areas. And, and in the UK, they're going to be called marine conservation zones. And this is a new designation which has come about under the Marine and Coastal Access Act, which was passed into law in 2009 after years of lobbying by a whole range of nature conservation organizations. 
And marine conservation zones are going to surpass what the previous uh, types of designations that we have on the, on the books uh, have been trying to do, which is to protect nature, but rather uh, poorly achieving that objective. So marine conservation zones are going to take us up to a new level of protection of the sea. Now, it's, it, it, it's, it's a little bit complicated because the UK is devolved uh, when it comes down to protecting the oceans. So we have different things going on in the four different administrations. So I'll start with England. Uh, and what's happening in England is that we have uh, a marine conservation zone project which is split into four. So one, one part's the North Sea, another part's the Southeast, then there's the Southwest and the Irish Sea. And in each of these regions, there is a group of stakeholders who have been uh, diligently getting together since uh, early last year in order to create a network of marine conservation zones according to a recipe book that has been established by Natural England and the Joint Nature Conservation Committee, so the government's statutory nature conservation bodies. And that recipe book basically tells you that uh, marine conservation zones need to protect these things, they need to be this sort of size, they need to be this far apart, now you decide where to put them. Uh, and so there's been a lot of heated debate going on around tables and closed rooms uh, for some time now. And we're coming to a really key point in this process because on June the 1st, they have to deliver their final designs for the network of marine conservation zones. That will consist, so far as we know, of about 124 conservation zones and then a, a number of reference areas. Now, Andy mentioned the, uh, the no-take zone. Well, reference areas are what we call something with that equivalent level of protection in the UK. We're not sure how many there will be. We're not sure how big there will be as yet. We don't know where they're going to be exactly, but that will all become clear uh, on the 1st of June. Now, moving north to Scotland, Scotland decided to go it alone. They have the Scottish Marine Act, and there is a commitment under that to establish a network of marine protected areas as well. In Scotland, they're not going to uh, uh, go for something as ambitious as the English network. They have decided uh, that they're going to use other measures, which basically means fishery protections of uh, things like uh, trawling closures, for example. But there is a, a, a desire uh, and an effort underway to establish marine protected areas in Scotland. Wales is using the Marine and Coastal Access Act of the UK to create a number of small, highly protected sites, no-take zones, in its waters to complement a range of other protections established under European legislation. And Northern Ireland isn't sure what it's going to do as yet. Uh, but it is exciting. It's a, it's a really amazing time to be active in marine conservation in the UK because uh, we could end up at the end of this with a world-class network of marine protected areas. The key questions I think which are open at the moment are how highly is this network going to be protected and uh, how extensive is it going to be. If it's highly protected, uh, on the whole, mixing a range of uh, reference areas, fully protected uh, from exploitation right through mobile fishing gear closures to various other sorts of protections, then I think uh, we're going to have something which is going to deliver real conservation benefits for the UK as a whole. I, I've seen the beginnings of this in uh, one small patch in Scotland. They're a local community, the uh, community of Aran Seabed Trust, lobbied the Scottish government for uh, 15 years in order to get a no-take zone in Lamlash Bay. And uh, just last summer, one of the students uh, uh, that uh, was working from the University of York in our lab went up there and started studying what was going on. It was established in 2008. And boy, in a couple of years it had come on. There was uh, a lot of seaweed there, lots of scallops uh, settling into this area. And it was very different indeed from the much more barren and open seabed habitat in the rest of the Firth of Clyde. That could be seeded all around the UK. We could soon see UK seas coming back to life. Thank you. I'm going to just put one. I'm going to give you that, Fred. Um, I know about the Lamlash Bay project. It is a fantastic project. And it was uh, a project that, as Callum said, was generated by 
the local people. So the local people have a real interest in looking after it, in protecting it, and it's worked. It's worked beautifully. But what you said in your talk was that we need to make sure that all these areas that are established, however many they are and wherever they are, the key is protection. And I know that Fred will probably talk about this with you as well, but let's talk about the UK. How do we protect those areas? How do we enforce this when, you know, People here may be behind marine protected areas or marine conservation zones, but there are an awful lot of people who aren't. So how are you going to persuade people to honour the boundaries and not fish them? Well, that is going to be very... Sorry, I'll give you that mic back. OK, I'll, I'll speak from this one. Uh, it is going to be a challenge to protect these marine conservation zones, especially because there are going to be so many of them. But one of the... Uh, reasons for having this stakeholder-driven process of selecting these areas is that it's thought that that will bring whole uh, communities of users more behind uh, the protected areas that eventually get established because they will have a stake in them and their constituencies will have a stake in them. So the commercial fishing people who have been represented on these groups will have uh, been part of the decision-making process to establish them local sea angling groups, uh, local scuba diving groups, uh, charter boats. And so the idea is that uh, by having that involvement right at the bottom, we will uh, see much greater compliance with protected areas. The ones that are further offshore and out of sight of land and you can't easily go there and say, well, look, somebody's fishing here and they shouldn't be, or somebody's doing something that they, uh, they shouldn't be, those, those will have to be policed in a different way. Now, in Europe, all boats bigger than 15 meters long, which means most of the offshore fleet have to carry a, a satellite positioning system which pings back the location to a monitoring uh, uh, center, and so we know where they are. And it's been possible in the United States to police some big offshore protected areas by looking at where the satellite uh, tracking data show the boats are going. And, and there have been prosecutions of boats for infringements on the basis of that satellite tracking data. So we need to get uh, quite clever with the use of new technologies. And I think eventually all of our inshore fleet as well will have to end up uh, carrying these types of satellite tracking devices. OK. Well, there are. Oh, go on, Andy. Is it, is it a good idea for me to I think add it on? is a good idea. Yeah, um, definitely. I, That's what you're here for. OK. The, the, um, Professor Roberts's points are exactly right. Two, two additional points. In thinking, if you look at the world, a map of the world, if the, it looks like the oceans of the world are international. It looks like you're going to have to get the United Nations involved if you're going to do any enforcement. And if you were a practical person, sadly, you would be a little bit discouraged at that point because the United Nations demonstrably has a lot of trouble being effective in things it tries to do. It has trouble keeping people from killing other people, let alone people from killing too many fish, right? So we, we have some good news for you, and Professor Callum's whole speech and talk has emphasized that. Your country, the Great Britain, controls vast amounts of ocean off its coast. Europe controls vast amounts of ocean off its coast. Every coastal nation in the world controls its oceans out to 200 nautical miles, which is 231 statute miles. They set the rules. Nothing happens, no fishing happens, no oil drilling happens, no mining activity happens within 200 nautical miles of any coastal country without the permission of that country. So you don't need the United Nations. You can go to those countries that have coast guards, that have competent governments, that have the capability of enforcing, and you can get them practically to do what needs to get done. So, and you were describing how that works. And as you correctly said, in the United, Nation, in the United States and in wealthier countries like Britain, these satellite transponders show people on radar screens whether a vessel is coming across a fishing zone and whether it's transiting at transit speed or transiting at fishing speed. And you can tell from a thousand miles away what's going on by the speed at which that vessel is transiting. If it's going at fishing speed through a no fishing zone, you can either wait for them to come to port and then send an inspector on board and say, we understand, we saw what you were doing. Or if you're a wealthy country, you can send out a, an airplane. And that's what they do in the Northern Pacific, where our most productive fishery is. And you do a visual ID. And you contact the captain of that ship. And you have a conversation. 
which leads to an enforcement action. So this is very practical. Third point, designing protections by a poorer country should be done so that the enforcement is easy. You should be realistic. You should set the rules so that they're self-enforcing as much as possible because you don't have the money for a big Coast Guard. You don't have the money for lots of overflights. Let me give you an example of that. I'm sure we'll hear more from our colleagues at the end of the table. The, the, the country of Belize in February of this year banned all trawling in its entire national ocean. This is a very poor country in terms of resources. It doesn't have a big Coast Guard. But they banned all trawling. Now, they have an active fishery of non-trawl boats, hundreds of non-trawl boats. Those fishermen, when they see a boat that is a trawling-sized boat, won't have to go have a conversation with the captain. It will be prima facie evidence that that guy is breaking the law. And they will be heavily motivated on their own, for their own self-interest to, to, to enforce the law. And, and it'll, it'll work without expenditure of a lot of government funds. Thank you, Andy. Um, well, uh, Callum has outlined um, the plan. Uh, some of us remain skeptical about whether they will actually get a good network of marine protected areas around the coast of Britain by 2012, but I've got faith in you, Callum. I'm sure you'll kick the right bums. Um, uh, but uh, Britain is actually responsible for a lot more ocean than just the 200 miles uh, out from our coastline. It's actually responsible for six and a half million square miles of ocean through our overseas territories. Which brings me neatly to Dr. Fred Ming, uh, who is going to tell us about uh, what has been happening in Bermuda. We hope something tremendously exciting and a real um, uh, contribution to the problem of our world's oceans. Right. Thank you, Kate. I guess I should stand like everybody else has done. Um, <clears throat> well, good evening, and I'm very uh, pleased to have been invited uh, to London uh, to this uh, very special event. And I bring you the uh, greetings from my government uh, and premier. Uh, Ms. Paula Cox. Um, what I would like to talk about this evening is some efforts uh, that are ongoing in Bermuda that we believe are pretty important. And these involve the Sagasso Sea. Now, how many of you know where the Sagasso Sea is or where Bermuda is for that matter? <laughs> okay. So that's not bad. That's at least 50%. Um, the Bermuda is the only territory within the Sagasso Sea. The Sagasso Sea is a very large mass of water that rotates very slowly clockwise in the mid-North Atlantic. And the Sagasso Sea, is, that rotation is driven by four major ocean currents, the Gulf Stream to the west, the North Atlantic, Atlantic Current to the north, the uh, very shallow Canary Current to the, uh, to the east, and the North, Northern Equatorial Current to the south. And uh, these currents drive that large rotor, but they also uh, bring in uh, garbage and trash and so forth that find their way into those various systems in the first place. So there's a problem of gathering this gyre called the Mid-North Atlantic Gyre, uh, or AKA the Sagasso Sea, is also a collecting point for garbage. It's a very important ecosystem. The ecosystem is based on the sargassum weed. Uh, we, call it, uh, we call it seaweed in Bermuda. It's a, it's a free-floating uh, algae, a brown algae, which occurs in large beds, sometimes in windrows on the ocean. Um, it's found in the Sargasso Sea. It's also found, the species that we have, we have two species. Uh, it's also found in the Gulf of Mexico. And it's known that these Sargasso species are, in fact, a keystone species, or they are keystone species, meaning that they are the, either the habitat, uh, food source, um, cover uh, to protect against predation, and so forth, for a very large number of species of various types. Uh, fin fish, um, uh, turtles, um, and various invertebrates. It actually has its own populations and its own community of crabs, very small crabs and fishes of various kinds, the sargasso fish, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's actually an ecosystem unto itself. 
And Bermuda, as I said, is the only uh, territory that is within the Sargasso Sea. So that gives us a very special uh, uh, sort of um, privilege, if you like. Now, what has happened is that um, two years ago, uh, the perfect storm uh, took place, and we were invited, uh, two of us from government were invited to uh, participate in a conversation in Washington with some uh, international environmentalists, marine environmentalists, uh, and conservationists, uh, headed up by a very elderly, uh, gentle lady by the name of Dr. Sylvia Earle. And um, she sat beside me and she, um, you know, she was very, very, very elegant and, and very persuasive and she said, you are going to do this, aren't you? <laughs> um, and what they wanted us to do, they wanted the Bermuda government to take the lead on bringing protections to the Sagasso Sea. Um, we've heard already about the kinds of protections that are necessary in the oceans, and those protections also apply to the Sargasso Sea. And uh, the government uh, seized upon this uh, after we got back and said, we'll do this as long as we don't have to spend anything. <laughs> Fortunately, um, our, our colleagues in Washington said, that's not a problem. Um, and uh, just give us a bit of time. They went to their various uh, supporters in the private sector, and a few months later, we were told that there was some, a, a pool of funds that had become available to initiate this process. These funds have come from private individuals of, 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 of means. And um, uh, since that time, a visioning exercise took place in Bermuda, a conference, if you like, where it was defined uh, what those objectives would be for this group that called itself the Sargasso Sea Alliance. And um, those uh, incorporate the kinds of protections we've talked about, and um, also uh, putting together an alliance not only of this small group that we have today, but also countries that are on the Atlantic Basin, if you like, that have some kind of a connection to the Sargasso Sea. And, and even though we are the only uh, state, if you like, or, or country, with a, uh, in the Sargasso Sea, there are a number of European countries, including yours, that are impacted by the Sargasso Sea. And one of the connecting points is actually a very lowly species of fish called the eel, the European eel, Anguilla Anguilla. And this eel spawns in the Sargasso Sea, rides the currents all the way up the coast of North America and across to, uh, to Europe, and there, these larvae are collected in river mouths and grown out today uh, to uh, mature size and sold into the market uh, for your sushi and, and whatnot. It's a very large uh, market, uh, something like 8,000 to 10,000 metric tons per year, and it's a very highly priced product. And we believe that this alone will stimulate some interest in these countries. We've, we've got a, a voyage from Germany right now that's working around Bermuda looking at eels. So we know the Germans are interested. Um, what I'd like to uh, leave you with is that um, there are two projects that are happening simultaneously, and I think this sort of gives us more confidence that we're likely to see a result. We've got uh, the government cooperating with the organization known as the Pew uh, Global Oceans Legacy. Uh, that is part of the sponsorship of this event. And they are on the, if you like, on the 200 mile line looking inward to create a no-take fishing zone of some size that is yet to be determined and yet to be agreed by government. And then we've got the Sargasso Sea Alliance that starts at that 200 mile line looking outward into the Sargasso Sea, looking to formulate a coalition of states and nations and so forth, uh, NGOs, uh, individuals of means and individuals, ordinary people of support to establish something that has never been done before. We believe this is doable. We believe the people who are engaged so far are committed. We've had a very positive response from the UK government and we hope to see uh, this uh, uh, realized. And um, I, I'd like to come back here in a few years time to tell you that we've, uh, not only have we made a declaration, but that we've actually got a protections mechanism in the works. Thank you. Can I just ask
um, ask you, Fred, uh, was there any sort of um, culture of marine protection in Bermuda before this idea was floated? Actually, um, Bermuda is probably the first country to have introduced marine conservation. In the 1600s, shortly after Bermuda was settled, uh, the turtles, the green turtle, was being exploited and taken at a very fast rate. And the settlers in Bermuda depended upon these turtles and other fish and so forth uh, around the islands for their survival. And so they did the right thing and they established a law protecting the green turtle and that was in the 1600s. Um, we've, in, the in 1968, we established the Coral Reefs Protection Act to protect our reefs. And you can no longer take coral. From that point on, you could not take coral as a souvenir home with you from vacation. Uh, in 1972, uh, the commercial fishermen led a, uh, a conservation effort to bring protection to certain group of species that were being overfished in their, in their, in their mines. And these uh, were the first, uh, they, so we've created 150 square kilometers of uh, marine protected areas where uh, groupers are protected seasonally when they aggregate to spawn. And um, so, we, yes, we do have some kind of a record. Thank you. Quite a good one, by the sounds of things. Any questions for Fred while we're here? Okay, well, um, I'm now going to introduce you to uh, Masio Nadong. Um, one of the other great challenges, as if there weren't enough, um, of any sort of conservation is making sure that uh, people count too. You can't do conservation in any sort of effective way if you don't involve people. And that is a challenge that Matteo has uh, faced in, in no small way with communities in Papua New Guinea. So let me hand over to her, Matteo. Thank you. Uh, I think I'll um, speak from where I'm sitting. <laughs> um, firstly, uh, I think uh, for purpose of my talk, I'm briefly going to explain the impact of um, uh, marine protected on um, communities. Uh, quickly look at that and then I, I'd like to highlight what we have done in the Western Central Pacific Ocean uh, in terms of banning um, uh, per se fishing on the high seas and uh, quickly look at some of the observations on, uh, uh, offer some uh, observations on um, marine protected um, areas. So I guess basically start with um, uh, oceans is very uh, important to uh, Papua New Guinea and people of the Pacific, uh, as most of you would know. Um, vast majority of our people live uh, in rural communities and rural areas. Um, they live off the ocean daily um, uh, for food, uh, fishing, um, and uh, so the connection with the ocean is uh, uh, a way of life. Uh, it's also a cultural connection. Um, the, over the years, um, our ocean has been healthy, in a healthy state, Western Central Pacific Ocean. Um, uh, but we are told that there is um, a decline in, in some of our fish stocks uh, in the region. And so um, uh, the impact on communities is uh, very important. And I just want to highlight some of the observations I had uh, on a recent survey in to some of the remote communities um, in Papua New Guinea. Um, one of, uh, I went to two uh, remote communities, um, Nukumanu and Kataret. They are close to the border of uh, Solomon Islands. And a couple of observations from that trip. Um, uh, the remoteness, it took us almost uh, three days to get to uh, to the islands um, and uh, na neighboring um, uh, when you look around there there's just oceans um, it takes uh, a long time to get food supplies to the islands they have to wait three months um, so um, uh, reliance on the ocean for food is very very important they they eat fish uh, almost daily um, and um, the challenges they're facing uh, as a community. Uh, we have a current ban on um, sea cucumber fishery uh, in Papua New Guinea in coastal areas. Um, and uh, mixed reaction from the community. First, oh, you, we can't um, 
meet school fees for our children. Uh, it's difficult. Um, even if they went fishing, um, it's difficult to sell fish because it takes three days to get to the, uh, to the main ports. Um, so those kind of challenges uh, people have. Um, uh, there's a general decline in, uh, in fishing grounds. Um, another observation we made, um, people resorting to breeding um, seaweeds, mussels, uh, in, in, in areas uh, where there's a lot of, you know, where there's ocean and you don't expect people to go into that sort of um, uh, activities. So um, those were um, observations we made. Um, uh, what else? Uh, impact of climate change, I believe, um, some of the communities to be relocated to the mainland. Um, uh, is also a, a, a challenge for the community. So I guess the point uh, with MPAs uh, uh, getting down to that level of would be um, uh, a good uh, and a positive way uh, to assist uh, communities in the long term uh, and uh, where, you know, oceans is uh, the way of life and uh, food security for people is so important. Um, in another island, um, uh, we observed and stories we've heard is that um, people have to go to fishing boats to buy bycatch again. Uh, so there must be some obvious um, impact from overfishing. Uh, uh, so these are the co sorts of challenges we have. Uh, um, so what are we doing about them? Um, uh, in Papua New Guinea uh, and in some of the neighboring islands, I'm aware, um, we have um, NGO involvement in um, assisting communities to uh, document their um, uh, areas, protected areas, uh, based on traditional knowledge. So um, it's, it won't be a new concept, really. It's, it's, people have al always done this. They've survived out there. So creating MPAs at that level uh, would be consistent to a lot of uh, uh, traditional practices and beliefs. Um, at the government level, um, there is already a ban on high seas fishing uh, per se in fishery. Uh, and uh, that's been in place for almost two years now. We've made it a, a condition of license. Um, so foreign fishing, uh, to fish in our waters, uh, you mustn't uh, fish on the high seas. And I guess um, we've, know, we've um, seen uh, improvements from that. It, it gives... Um, uh, uh, the ban has also given uh, positive uh, uh, feedback. Uh, we've seen positive uh, feedback from that uh, improved uh, reporting. Um, we know the data coming from our waters. Uh, those has been positive uh, uh, signs from uh, banning the high seas from fishing. Um, quickly, um, I think MPAs um, uh, would be of benefit to local communities and from the um, cucumber, uh, from the sea, uh, uh, ban at the moment, uh, we've seen um, uh, sea cucumber was actually growing in numbers, although it has uh, a negative impact on li uh, livelihood of the people at the same time. Uh, from a uh, regulator's point of view, um, we've seen improvements there. So we believe if we can um, have that on uh, ban on the high seas, uh, it would have similar effect, we believe. Um, uh, MPAs are important for us uh, as, as, a, as a country, uh, developing uh, countries where um, I guess we, um, we can use the knowledge uh, from the oceans for other uses as well, benefits in medical research. Also, it gives us the opportunity to develop capacity for our local scientists. Um, um, it also um, helps to decision makers to um, uh, use the knowledge um, or uh, perhaps um, uh, when they're faced with seabed mining, for instance, you use um, uh, uh, decision makers to um, uh, allocate uh, resource, uh, you know, prioritization. Uh, do, do you, um, where do you, uh, where there's conflicts, uh, it, it helps. So I guess um, for us in the region, with two years um, uh, a ban on the high seas at the moment, we see a lot of positive uh, signs from that, and we would like to continue to support um, the ban in uh, every way we can. And of course, we would um, uh, appreciate other 
uh, you know, um, other support from those who are in influence to go down that path with us. Thank you. Um, I don't know whether any of you have ever been to one of Intelligence Squared talks before. I have. Uh, they tend to be quite vicious affairs sometimes with a lot of people with a lot of very differing opinions. Now, the uh, sharp-eared amongst you uh, in the audience will realise that basically we're all on the same side. <laughs> We all agree that marine protected areas are a good thing. Um, so now it's over to you. This is your chance to be Paxman for the night. If you don't know who Jeremy Paxman is, no, he's quite vicious. Um, so uh, don't expect an easy ride. Um, I think we've got some roving mics. Can I just check, cause are these mics now working? Do we know, can we just do a little test? Callum, testing, sing testing, us a song. testing. No, testing, testing. You're, I think your two are and yeah. your two aren't. So if we can, I'll, I'll hand the mic to the guy. If you can, you know, be friendly. And uh, let's start uh, with this brave gentleman in the middle. Hello, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to all the speakers. Uh, my question is to Callum Roberts. You talked about the participatory approach in a very positive voice. And well, I agree. It is important that there is a participatory approach. To what extent in the UK context do you believe this might lead to the identification of marine reserves in areas that are not necessarily particularly ideal for species or biodiversity? To what extent might we end up with a, a network of biodiversity poor uh, zones for the UK? That's, that's a very good question and uh, I think it comes about because if you ask people uh, who have economic stakes in the sea to decide where they're going to put places that they can't do some of the things that they've been doing for a long time, then they will find the places that they don't use very much. And it may just turn out that those places are not very good for very much, and that's why they don't use them. So in other words, we could be looking at creating a network of protected areas that is going to protect probably the least valuable places in the oceans. Now, countervailing that uh, uh, tendency is the fact that some of those places that are no longer very productive today would have been productive in the past and it is possible that if you give them sufficient protection they're going to be able to re-establish some of those benefits. Um, but uh, it's, it's very hard to please everyone all at the same time and so there has been quite a lot of uh, compromises made. There have been some excellent places, I think, in the proposed areas, uh, the proposed blueprints for marine uh, conservation zones around the UK that will have major uh, benefits for conservation if they gain sufficient protection. So, so I think that, that there's a risk um, and uh, there is clearly some avoidance of some of the most important fishing zones. But then that's, that's the, the way in which the government has been trying to engage with the fishing industry and say, look, if you're part of this process, then it's going to hurt less than if you uh, stay outside and just fight from the edges. Thank you. Yes. Uh, hi, my question's for Andrew. Um, uh, while you're changing your microphone, um, you mentioned the United Nations uh, are not needing to be involved and that individual countries could act uh, um, uh, unilaterally. If you have some countries doing a lot to protect their, their seas and other countries doing nothing, does the problem of overfishing just move to somewhere else? <laughs> no. Okay, I'll work off this one. Um, everybody can hear the question. I could. Can everybody hear the question? Okay. Um, displaced fishing activity. Um, short answer is yes, some of that will happen. Um, the longer answer is that the sorts of activities that we're describing here, the protective actions that we're describing here, will very rapidly produce more fish in the sea. Fish, have, fish are incredibly fertile by and large. There are exceptions, but many fish lay eggs by the millions. And if you will do the right things for those fish, if you will give them a little bit of room, a little bit of help, <laughs> they will cooperate extremely quickly. And in five or six years, with many species, not every species, you can see measurable abundance back in the water. 
Uh, one experiment that's famously discussed in the literature uh, is known as World War II. There was a little, there was a protected area known as the Northern Atlantic, uh, enforced by a problem known as Nazi submarines. <laughs> And you didn't want to be out there trawling or doing anything if you didn't need to be. And after this four or so long year protected exercise, the fishing fleets of Britain and Canada and the United States and other European countries went back to work and guess what they found? Surprising numbers of fish. So the basic underlying situation is I believe that the, fi the, the, the increase in abundance from the protected places will allow the fishing fleets that are out there to um, come back in after the protections have started to take effect and catch more fish than they are now and not to be permanently displaced. I think there could be a temporary displacing activity. Um, every country, as I said, controls whether or not people fish in their waters. So, the other, the countries that are being displaced from the fishing fleets that are being displaced under your question will have to come knock on the proverbial door of the unprotected place and ask for permission. And it's always under the you know, authority of that country to say, no, I don't want any more fishing here. It's, it's not, they don't have to take it. Now, some of them will because they'll be offered money and they'll take it. But they, there's no requirement that they do that to their disadvantage. Did you want to add something? I just want, want to add uh, one, one slight point to that, and that is that uh, the lack of protection in European waters has actually exported our fisheries to other countries. And so we now import into Europe 60% of all the fish that we consume, and much of it's taken from the waters of developing countries. Now, producing protected areas domestically is going to hopefully reverse that process, and. Uh, the projections are that we could increase our catches in Europe by 60% if we were to establish good management of fisheries and a network of protected areas too. Anything that either of you would like to add? I'd just like to be the devil's advocate here and just say that um, I think it's um, really important for um, the UK to embrace um, marine protected areas on a and or no-take um, uh, reserves on a, on a greater scale um, to bring consistency uh, between what is being done in the overseas territories on the one hand and what is being done or not done at home. Mm. Um, I, I so think you think that our government is putting more pressure on overseas territories to kind of do the work that they think is going to be a little bit onerous and a little bit expensive and a little bit we don't really want to be bothered and also you know no one can afford a bus pass at the moment so how are we going to persuade them to pay for marine protected areas but I know we'll get Bermuda to do it for us <laughs> instead. I, I didn't quite say that. <laughs> you said that. But. Every, everybody heard it. <laughs> um, do you think that's true? I mean, I will say one thing. Andy and I uh, had a meeting this morning about how we're going to change the world. And um, I did say that there is uh, one um, big uh, stumbling block as far as uh, certainly British marine protected areas goes. And it's called the French. And perhaps you would like to tell your French story, just to back up so that I don't get, sorry if anyone is French here, but you know, I mean really, the behavior is shocking. Go ahead, tell that story. So um, there is a particularly destructive form of fishing called a drift net. Anybody here not know what a drift net is? Okay, a drift net is a vertical net, a gill net, it's hung from buoys on the surface of the water, usually about 20 meters deep, sometimes very, very long. It can be anywhere from two kilometers long or 100 yards long up to 20 kilometers long. It is not secured to the bottom of the ocean. It is a drift net. It is set out for typically eight or 10 hours at a time, and then the boats come back, they reel them in. It catches everything that swims into it and kills that. They were banned by the European Union shortly after the new millennium because they were so non-selective, because they were so dis destructive. 
We, at the start of Oceania, were concerned about the fact that the Moroccans, not part of Europe, would not subject to this ban, were continuing to drift net in the western Mediterranean, the Alboran Sea, south of Spain. And WWF did a report that estimated that every summer, dolphins migrate across the western Mediterranean and encounter the, the Moroccan drift net fleet, 180 boats, and t 10 to 12,000 dolphins drown every summer in these nets targeting swordfish. So we had a vessel donated to us by one of our board members, which we called Ranger, and we sent them into the western Mediterranean to take photographs of the Moroccans, to bring pressure on them to do what Europe had done. So we sailed in, it's an, it's an American flag vessel, captained by a Spaniard, international crew. We come through the Straits of Gibraltar and discover that there is drift netting going on in the Mediterranean. It's being done by the French and the Italians. Hmm. 92 French boats drift netting. Wow. 400 Italian boats drift netting. Jeez. This is five years ago in blatant violation of the European Union directive, which was unambiguous. So we took pictures of the French and we took pictures of the Italians and we reported them to the governments and we said you need to take action and the Italians started to slowly take action. And they started working their way down the country. The French said, no, you don't understand. We've read the directive and the directive says you can't have a net without an anchor. Well, we have installed an anchor. <laughs> it's a floating anchor. I'm sorry if you're French here, I'm mocking you, I apologize. <laughs> But they, they're literally, the argument deserves mockery because it was, we are legal, we have installed a floating anchor. It doesn't touch the bottom of the ocean, but it's an anchor, therefore we qualify, they were, therefore we're, we, can, we continue to do this. We said this is outrageous. Many northern European countries, of which Britain was one, said this is outrageous. We continue to photograph them and report them year after year. One summer, about three summers ago, we were photographing a drift netter off the coast of France and suddenly he dropped his net in the water abruptly and we went up closer our cameras running and we thought to ourselves we got him he sees a, a dolphin in the net and he doesn't want to pull that up and have us take a picture so we got as close as we could with our cameras running at which point this fisherman this French fisherman stepped onto the stern of his vessel and shot off a flare into the into the sky and five minutes later, his colleagues came in six different boats from all points of the compass at high speed, circled our boat, and started throwing fish at us in the spines of stingrays and dropping their pants and making gestures, Gallic gestures, with both sides of their bodies. You can see this on YouTube if you wish. It's available. I'm serious. We're filming the whole thing. They then... Um, took a rope and tied it around a buoy and went fast. We tried to get away from them, of course, but we couldn't maneuver as fast as they could, and went right across in front of us and tied the rope, got the rope tangled in our propeller. So we were immobilized now at sea. Now, they then took out their boat hooks, and they approached to board. And a week later, I was talking to, in our regular management meeting, to Javier Pastor, who runs Oceana in Europe, and I said, Javier, what were you doing at this moment as they, like, guys approach with their pants off and their boats ho boat hooks? We have men and women on this boat. It's a very international thing. It's kind of like Star Trek, you know. <laughs> and um, he said, well, I figured they were going to just confiscate the videotape that we had just taken of them. So we were taking blank videotapes and we were putting today's date on it. And we were taking the actual videotapes and we were hiding them on the vessel. I thought it was a pretty cool, pretty cool customer there. We also were radioing for help. <laughs> and we were doing mayday calls, and shortly thereafter, the authorities sent a helicopter. You can see that on YouTube, too, and that scares away the fishermen. Now, I'm making the story too long, but the end of the story, skipping over a step, is that the next day, it's getting toward the end, is that the next day there was a press conference in Marseille. The French spokesman for the French fleet, Driftnet fleet, said, terrible thing happened yesterday. Our fleet was attacked at sea by Greenpeace in a vessel called Oceana. <laughs> Greenpeace immediately issued a press release saying, we don't have a vessel called Oceana. We were not, we issued a press release saying, we are Oceana. <laughs> we were attacked and we have the videotape to prove this. 
that we were attacked. We then went into the Corsican harbor to deliver, to show that we weren't afraid of the French authorities, delivered the videotape to get sent to Madrid and be released to the press. By the way, that night, the Corsican Port Authority came out to us and said, the French are coming. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't want you to be here when they get here. <laughs> because they're going to barricade you in the harbor. And kind of like, you're on your own, guys, if that happens. So you might want to leave before the French get here. <laughs> so we did. Um, and to cut a long story short, we cut the videotape as one would into a press-worthy document. We released it to the press. It was news. And the British fishery minister at that time, Ben Bradshaw, who had known for a long time that the French were cheating, had something he could really put to good work. And he went to Brussels, and he demanded that the cheating stop. And there then began a process in Brussels where they rewrote the directive to say, if it's a floating anchor, it's still not an anchor. <laughs> and they got the loophole clearly closed. And even sparing you some more details, there are now no longer any French drift netters on, on the right. train. Yes. <laughs> Lady in the this you in the in the good T-shirt, yeah. <laughs> oh, hold on. There's a mic coming behind you. Hi. Um, in relation to exactly the uh, the last question, um, and we had the uh, security ocean security meeting the other day. Um, it's I'm again facing the same issue, which is about corruption, about avoiding loopholes. Um, obviously, this is something that uh, European authorities can cope with or deal with. Uh, in terms of developing countries, um, and as you're saying, um, they don't have enough force to, basically, they don't have enough power to enforce those legislations. Uh, in terms of protecting their ocean territories, uh, even if they do, uh, if, even if they have those marine protected areas, um, in terms of corruption, we know that every, every country pays a certain fee um, to fish in, in foreign territories. In terms of corruption, uh, even when this is happening, just like we had the case of Senegal the other day, we had a representative. Um, how, would, how do you see developing countries protecting their territories? And not only in terms of, as we will have, uh, hopefully in the UK, uh, marine protected areas or no tag zones, um, how would actually the legislation, legislation solve that? And are there any current cha changes in legislation taking place um, in the UK, both Europe um, and in uh, developing countries, for example, Papua New Guinea. So this is my question. Shall we, um, did everyone get the, the sense of that, basically, what, particularly with regards to developing countries that perhaps don't have the resources and the clout of, of a European nation to, to take on people who don't play by the rules, um, is there any legislation to help them? And um, Matthew, maybe you can... Uh, Tell us what, what you're able to do in Papua New Guinea. The governance is an uh, interesting... Uh, oh, not sorry, interesting. can we just get... We'll just get your mic. Is that mic on, guys? There we are. Um, governance is, a, is, a, is, is an issue that uh, most um, developing countries, like my country, uh, face all the time. Uh, and um, one of the ways in which we have... Uh, tried, attempted to strengthen, strengthen this has been in the allocation of license. Um, some years ago, um, license allocation or rights to fishing were given to the minister. Um, but uh, we made a change to that, having gone through um, experiences uh, with, uh, uh, you know, being confronted with uh, governance issues. For in, I'll just give an example. Um, there was a, a situation once where we were involved in excess negotiations with a certain um, uh, foreign uh, um, uh, fleet. Uh, and um, before we could get to the um, uh, agreement, we, had, we were at loggerheads as to how much they would uh, pay. Um, the next day we were told um, that uh, the fee had already been concluded. 
And so, you know, it puts a lot of the officials in a, a difficult situation. And this, this kind of um, uh, uh, issues we face all the time. So in, in, in our legislation, um, uh, allocation of uh, anything to do with uh, giving rights to um, uh, foreign fishing or for that matter to our domestic, uh, it goes through a clear, transparent process. So we keep the political um, people out of the way. Uh, it's de dealt with uh, merely officials comprising of different agencies. So um, that's, we found that to be quite uh, effective. Um, anyway, that's just uh, on, on the issue of licenses. Uh, in terms of enforcement, um, for, for example, putting it in the context of MPAs, um, this would be a challenge for us uh, uh, with the, uh, the, the explanation I, uh, or the highlight of remote, uh, remoteness of communities because um, from Port Mosby going to, out to the islands, it took almost like a week to get to the most remote of the locations. So of course, uh, this is a, a practical problem. You know, we put a ban on, but you know, we're in Port Mosby and, and there's not enough uh, enforcement officers out in the provinces. Um, um, I'm sure poachers come in and out of the water. So these are real situations and it's something that again, uh, we have to work on and we're working on them. Uh, yes, this. Hi. Hello. Is it on? Can you hear me? I should say that uh, I work for an organization that supports the, the fishing industry. Uh, but before you start throwing fish at me, uh, we do support <laughs> MPAs. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll try and be uh, and, and, uh, Jeremy Paxson, Paxman and, and, and be argumentative. The first point, uh, Andrew, I think you're getting mixed up, I think you're getting entangled in fisheries management and biodiversity protection. In the UK, most of our fish stocks swim long distances, protecting small areas, will not protect our herring, will not protect our mackerel, will not protect our cod, will not protect our haddock. We can have a, f a huge fishing effort around these relatively small MPAs to hoover them all up. That brings me on the, the on point of my question. It's been well documented, well studied, well reported, that the success of MPAs, uh, and uh, it's been alluded to tonight, uh, Masia and Dr. Uh, Ming, that we need to involve fishermen. We need to seek fishermen's support. My organization, we've developed inshore vessel monitoring systems that bleep every two minutes. It's two hours at the moment, hours every two minutes to demonstrate that fishermen can work inside MPAs and avoid the sensitive areas. We run a, a responsible fishing scheme and accreditation scheme for responsible fishing, blah, blah, blah. The point being, we need fishermen, we need their compliance. Enforcement is the last resort. We want compliance, not have to do as much enforcement. Fishermen know their, their, their fishing grounds intimately. So, I would like to ask all four for their ideas, their suggestions on how best to get the fishermen and their communities on board. Come, let's start. <laughs> I work for the uh, Sea Fish Industry Authority. It's a non-departmental government body. Thank you. Um, well, Callum, let's uh, see if you can start because you are obviously working with fishermen or you believe you are? <laughs> well, I, I've worked with fishermen for a long time on various uh, protected areas of various scales, and I, I would say that the, the first statement that you made, which was that uh, marine protected areas won't benefit things like uh, cod, is, is just wrong. Uh, there's a really interesting case um, in uh, the, the entrance to the Baltic Sea. So as, as you go into the Baltic Sea from the North Sea, there's this really tortuous uh, strait going around Denmark. And there's a little piece of that which is called the Orisund, and it's about uh, 40 kilometers long by about, and it varies between about 4 and 40 kilometers wide. Now this is an area which is an extremely busy shipping lane, and uh, because of that, it has, it has been protected from bottom trawling since 1932. And uh, by contrast, there's an area to the north called the Kattegat, 
which has been open to bottom trawling since uh, the, the same period. Now, if you go to the Orison, you find the only big cod in southern Europe. I mean, as in, as in the southern part of northern Europe. There are some really big cod there. They're caught using gill nets, and uh, the area in the, to the north, the Kattegat, has no big cod, just like every other part of the North Sea and uh, uh, further to the west where the cod have been really taken out to uh, a large degree. So protection has worked for cod uh, at that scale. If you go to Iceland, they use large-scale protected areas for cod and for haddock. Uh, they do so in the Faroes as well. It's just a matter of getting the scale right. And we can do that in the, in the North Sea. We can do it in the Irish Sea. We can do it in the Southwest. And in fact, the Southwest of the UK, if you want to look at UK waters, is the only place where cod are doing reasonably well, you know, until you get to, to areas to the north of Scotland. So the reason for that is that there's large areas that are off limits to bottom trawling because it's too rugged or the tidal uh, uh, currents are too strong in that area. So there's a de facto refuge. So I think uh, one of the things that really engages people in the fishing industry more effective than anything else is when they see uh, that what their traditional way of life uh, is, is doing is, is going down the plug hole. And um, in places where I've worked with fishing communities like the Caribbean, um, they, they came to protected areas as, as a last resort. But within a few years, they've become uh, convinced that protected areas were bringing back their fish stocks. Within seven years of the implementation of a network of protected areas in St. Lucia, catches had doubled in the uh, areas uh, to either side of these, uh, these little protected areas. So it, it can help bring the fishing industry back. And uh, frankly, in, in much of the areas around the UK, we have got to rock bottom. Uh, uh, you only have to look at somewhere like the Firth of Clyde, which is now down to two species, uh, prawns and scallops. Mm. They're the only things left uh, from what used to be an incredibly diverse and prolific piece of ocean around the UK. So uh, protected areas are a positive thing, and I, I, I wish that, um, uh, the, the, that there was a, a little less uh, suspicion of them in the fishing industry. There's a lot of growing evidence from around the world that they can work for fisheries as well as biodiversity conservation. Can I just pick up on a point that Andy made right uh, at the beginning, in the beginning of your, you know, why marine reserves? And one of the things that you said was jobs. But that does seem counterintuitive when it appears, certainly to, to, to the people that you're working with, that you're trying to stop people doing their jobs, you're trying to stop people fishing. So how do you square that circle, or circle that square? <laughs> You, you, you circle that square in five years, in, you know, in, in time. And, and you, you may suffer some restrictions for four or five years that reduce the available fish to the, to the fleet. But they will be more than paid back um, by abundance that comes in after that period of time. And, and in the most competent fishermen in the world see this. The most competent commercial fishermen in the world see this. The, the most productive, to your question about can we get fishermen in support of this, yes, we do. Um, and it does happen in some places. It doesn't happen everywhere. The most productive American fishery is the Northern Pacific fishery. And this is a place where people make a lot of money, and we have a lot of fish, and it's well managed, and it's a smart and intelligent part of the planet for fishery production. We proved the, the, the rules for that fishery, basically, are set by an American committee, governmental committee, composed of fishermen. Under American law, it's composed chiefly of commercial fishermen and a few government officials, not conservationists. So to get the rules set, you have to convince representatives like you of the industry uh, to, do the, to do what we want to do. We got a no-troll zone declared over vast areas of the Northern Pacific, huge areas, hundreds of square miles, voted unanimously by this commission, this commission that is composed of fishermen. Because 80 to 90 percent of the boats in that were not trawlers. They were not bottom trawlers. They were trawlers. They were not bottom trawlers. And the 80 to 90 percent of the fishermen saw that the bottom trawlers were destroying their future because they were ripping up the nursery areas. And they saw that it was in their interest to, to take these, 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 these uh, future untrolled areas off the table from the trawlers 
and they voted it through. So that's a very encouraging example of what you're calling for and, and, and does happen. It doesn't happen everywhere, though, unfortunately. And the, and the track record, unfortunately, is. If you ask, how did we get to the situation we're in now, where the oceans are collapsing? Is it because the people who set the rules were just stupid? Is it because they were not paying attention at all? Or was it because they were under pressure by somebody to do something that was short-sighted? Well, who do you think that was in general? It was the commercial fishing fleets the big industrial fleets pushing for higher quotas, more aggressive uh, tro trolling opportunities than was scientifically sensible. So the, the fleet has not on its own done anything except in general bring us to a bad space situation. There are exceptions that I hope you're part of the progressive part of the fleet, sounds like you are. Uh, there are good wings to the fleet, but as a group on the worldwide basis, they're the ones that have been driving the system up till now, and the, and the results have been pretty bad. You said that uh, you'd done a lot of work in Bermuda with your local fishermen, but how do they feel about the, the, the possibility, we hope the very real possibility, of a very large uh, marine protected area? As we say, we don't know its status yet, how much will be no take zone, if any. But, but how, have, you, have you had talks with local fishermen? Have, you, have they been part of the process? <clears throat> that's, that's, a, that's a very good question because, um, well, first of all, we have two kinds of fishing uh, in Bermuda. We have, um, we have what we call uh, charter boat fishing, which um, goes after these highly migratory species like the bill fishes, you know, your marlins, your swordfish, and so forth. And these, these uh, vessels will work within perhaps uh, 30 or 40 miles of the coastline. <clears throat> and uh, that fishery has uh, declined quite a bit. And, I, and, and obviously it's because those stocks have, have declined likewise. And so those fishermen are feeling the pinch. In other words, I think it's that group will probably be very receptive to anything that's going to suggest that in future the stocks can improve. So um, the next group is the, uh, what we call the commercial fishermen who uh, go after fish on the, what we call the Bermuda platform. And the Bermuda platform is about a thousand square kilometers of fairly shallow water to about uh, 200 meters of depth on the, on the far reaches. And uh, these fishermen, for the most part, um, go after reef fish. And as I said already, we have in place uh, protected areas that are protected seasonally. Um, and, they, and they listen to, they, they respect and they, those they, they, re they more or less respect that. They also take uh, some of the migratory species at certain times of year. We have not, to get closer to the answer, we have not um, gone to the body of fishermen as yet. But what we did do very early on is get one of the, one of the activists in that community engaged by getting them at the table. And uh, so when we were having discussions with Pew, they were, they were there at the table. And, um, that was something that I suggested. I know the individual very well. I know that he can be very dangerous. And so it's, you know, I, he's better close up where you can see him. <laughs> um, the fishing community is not uh, sort of a, uh, you know, they don't speak with one voice. But we do have people in that community, in the commercial fishing community, and in the uh, charter fleet or the charter boat community who are highly respected by their peers because they've been in it for a long time, they've done well, they've made a living at it, um, and uh, by and large, they are people who respect the rules. Um, they haven't been in trouble with, uh, with, with the law, they haven't been arrested or anything for, um, for violating the Fisheries Act 1972. So uh, the strategy is to um, start from the center and, and go out slowly and speak with these respected, influential people to see if we can get them on board. Okay, 
I'm going to stop you there. Um, we've got five minutes. Um, yes. Hi there. Um, is this working? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi. Um, I appreciate that tonight has mostly been about overfishing. Um, I'm going to ask a question that's a bit different. Um, just over a year ago, the world's uh, biggest industrial disaster occurred in the Gulf of Mexico, the BP oil spill, um, which affected fishing communities up and down the Gulf Coast um, and further afield. Um, as I said, I realize that tonight's been about fishing. However, um, I was wondering what the panel's reaction was to the spill and um, what you thought of the company's subsequent reaction was to the oil. Um, and if you think that, sorry, it's three questions. Um, and if you think that the stocks are bouncing or will bounce back. Okay, very good question. Um, and uh, let's have, see who can do the quickest answers. It's like a competition. So, uh, Massio. Was, was it a story in PNG? Did people, did people talk about the, the uh, oil spill? Been, yes, yes. It, it was been quite, um, of course, like... Uh, and, um, yes, the enormity of the um, spill uh, was of concern. And I think for a lot of us uh, with uh, oil spill is, is something that we, have, um, uh, we would have concerns, especially for... Um, capacity issues in our own countries and so we did follow the developments there and uh, you know uh, and what did you think of uh, the the American government's response and BP's response do you think they were appropriate did they do you think they did the right thing uh, well I, I haven't followed the story on the full uh, so I'm not uh, able to but um, maybe somebody else uh, could um, offer comments because I'm not... Um, um, it's a long way from yeah, PNG. And it I haven't is. followed the <laughs> developments there. So. Fred? Yeah, we in Bermuda were interested um, for a couple of reasons, um, both from the pollution standpoint and from the impact, potential impact on stocks. Uh, the reason for the pollution concern is that um, the Gulf of Mexico, uh, sorry, yeah, the, the Gulf Stream rather, comes out of the Gulf of Mexico and then it runs beside Bermuda and gives us our warm weather. Um, <clears throat> now, there are also eddies that spin off from the, Gulf of Mex Gulf of, from the Gulf Stream as it goes north. And these eddies can carry all kinds of flotsam and jetsam you know, into areas. And those, those things can stay there for a long time. And so we were, th we were concerned not so much about fresh oil as much as about tar balls. And we've had a history of dealing, having to deal with tar balls, particularly in the 1970s, late 1970s, early 1980s. And, and did, did, has that happened yet? Have, have you we have not seen any tar balls. Um, fortunately, we're very happy about that. And Do you know where the tar balls are coming from? Yes, well, it's possible to actually uh, fingerprint the, the tar or the oil and make a connection uh, to the source. That, that is possible. In fact, a lot of that work was done in Bermuda at the uh, Bermuda Institute of Ocean Science. Uh, I'm going to have to hurry you, yeah. sorry. Just, just the final point about the, the impact on fish stocks. There's, there's a, several people in the, who, who, are, who are looking at sargassum believe that the, the sargassum that we have in the Sargasso Sea actually originates uh, in part uh, in the Gulf Stream and makes its way into the Sargasso Sea on the Gulf Stream. Sorry, in the, in the Gulf of Mexico, it makes its way into the Sargasso Sea on the Gulf Stream. So we, um, I said earlier that we rely on highly migratory species of fish as, as, as part of our fish uh, catch. And a lot of these actually are known to travel between Bermuda and the Gulf of Mexico or in that general vicinity. So we were concerned that perhaps some of these stocks actually spawn in the Gulf and could be impacted by the very extensive damage that was done to the Sagasso stocks in the Gulf of Mexico. That we know that it happened. Um, we've been in touch with universities there and so forth, so um, okay. it's, it's a real, it was a real concern but for us. But was the response good enough? I think the response was, uh, was not good enough to begin with. Um, the, uh, the, the, the company was dismissive, and uh, clearly they were caught with their pants down, I think. Um, they, the, the, the fact that the environmental impact assessment 
said what the company was going to do if, if any walruses got uh, oil. That, that said that this was a, a company that was completely unprepared. And unfortunately, there's going to be more of this going on in the future because we are now uh, exploiting oil at the deeper margins of the ocean. So I think the lessons from this will have to be learned much more widely in order to avoid uh, similar severe problems in the future. I'm really sorry, everybody. It is now 8.30, um, so we have no more time. But I'm going to allow you to ask your question because your hand has been up for a very long time. So if it can be quick and if we can have Thank very you. quick answers. I would la like to share the point of view of countries like Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. We have the longest coastal line, and yet our fishermen with small boats have no job because all the trolleys are going to take their fish away if they, carry, uh, if they fish, or the trawlers from very developed civilized countries, including Thailand and Japan and India, uh, more civilized than us, are, are doing all kinds of non-illegal uh, 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 fishing, including current net mm -hmm. that destroys the fish resource. But the sea is not well. I, I think Bay of Bengal is dying. Uh, the, the, the bazaar uh, uh, in Mexico, the baza, uh, um, uh, baza uh, underwater um, uh, uh, tropical forest is also in very bad shape. So are do we, you, do you my have concern, any marine protected areas in Bangladesh? Um, uh, we have started uh, protecting, but our concern is not what we are, are ourselves doing, but some things are happening. Uh, that perhaps is not being monitored. It could be related to sea level rise, it could be related to pollution, or something else is happening. The sea is not well, and let us not, at least from my point of view, I know that uh, if there is no fish, that means there is no other marine life, and we ought to be very concerned. Thank you very much indeed. You have just done a beautiful closing statement on my behalf. I don't need to say, I don't think, any more than that. I hope this has been uh, an illuminating evening for you all. Um, the good news is that if you think that marine protected areas are a good idea, then you can put your hand in your pockets and donate to the Project Ocean Appeal. Um, I sat, I'm not sure whether I'm allowed to say this, but I'm going to. I sat in an early meeting with uh, Selfridges and um, with some of the people, uh, the, the NGOs involved uh, in setting up Project Ocean and watched as the financial director of Selfridges handed over a cheque for £50,000. That cheque, I know, I think that does deserve a big round of applause. That cheque has been translated into the uh, 54th marine protected area, 34th, 34th marine protected area in the Philippines, where I was uh, last year, I saw how these marine protected areas work. They really, really do. The biggest marine protected area in that region of the Philippines is the one that Selfridges funded. And we can fund more between us. There is a wonderful window outside where you can text and you can get a little egg and all these things happen. Or frankly, you can just go onto the Project Ocean website and, you know, give them a thousand pounds, give them two thousand pounds, give them two pounds, but give them something because this really is where marine conservation has to go to be effective. And I hope that our panel has done something to uh, persuade you of that this evening. But let's say a big thank you to Andy Sharpless. <laughs> Callum Roberts. <laughs> Dr. Fredney. And Natalie Omegon. And thank you to all of you. Thanks very much indeed. <laughs>